Hello, my name is Ryan Field, and I'm here representing the work of an outstanding team of nearly 40 scientists and engineers at Kernel. For those of you who don't know, Kernel is a growing neurotech company based in Los Angeles, and we're focused on building the most capable and scalable non-invasive brain interfaces that have ever existed. The work I will present today focuses on our Kernel Flow product, a scalable time domain functional near infrared spectroscopy system for optical brain imaging. In this talk, I will briefly walk you through the architecture of the device we have built and the key elements of the modular kernel flow device. I will then review benchmark results that we have achieved using our system with two widely used standards, the basic instrument performance protocol and the MedFoat protocol. These two benchmarks are specifically aimed at evaluating the performance of time domain NEARS systems. Finally, I will present an example dataset collected during a standard neuroscience validation task. For those in the audience who are not familiar with optical brain imaging, it is a well-established field of research that has been active for several decades. Work from others has shown the power of continuous wave functional near infrared spectroscopy through direct comparisons with fMRI. The underlying principle behind FNIRS is that the optical absorption spectra in the infrared range differs between the oxygenated and deoxygenated states of hemoglobin as seen in this chart. A CW FNIRS device would typically choose two or more wavelengths on either side of the isobestic point. This is the point where the absorption spectra of the two species of hemoglobin are equal. A constant intensity laser or LED at these wavelengths would be used to interrogate the sample while optical detectors would measure changes in the received intensity of light. This can then be used to determine the relative concentrations of the hemoglobin. Using a combination of many sources and detectors allows for tomography. With the best systems classified as high density diffuse optical tomography or HD dot, these systems are capable of producing fMRI like images as you can see here. In recent years, there have been several efforts to take advantage of improved electronic integration to miniaturize CWF near systems. For example, both this NIRX system and this Gower Lab system achieve high density coverage, but the Gower Lab system is drastically smaller thanks to their efforts of integration. However, in the field of time domain FNIRs, there has been almost no progress made on improving the form factor, despite the richness and in information that TDF NIRs provides. Nearly three years ago, we started the development of our kernel flow device to bring a scalable solution to TDF mirrors. I mentioned the richness of the information that TDF mirrors provides. The information content in the signal is all driven by the ability to precisely measure changes in detected intensity on the sub nanosecond timescale. These figures of Monte Carlo simulations illustrate the principle behind time domain F mirrors and point to its power. In each figure, the red dot is the point at which we launch a 100 picosecond laser pulse into a modeled head with the brain located in the bottom portion of the image. The cloud of black lines that you see are the paths that each photon in that laser pulse takes as it scatters through the tissue. The blue dot is where we have placed the detector and record the simulated measurements shown along the bottom. In these figures along the bottom, a time window of three nanoseconds is shown along the x-axis, while detected photon intensity is shown on the y-axis. The blue regions you see correspond to the group of photons that travel along the scattered paths in the figures above them. As you can see from the sequence, the photons that arrive at the detector later in time are more likely to reach the brain. This is a powerful feature of time domain systems in that we can differentiate between photons that reach the brain and those that don't. Further, the shape of the measured signal is a function of the absorption and scattering properties of the tissue. This allows us to easily determine bulk optical properties of the tissue using these time domain techniques. With this background on time domain, it is clear why this technology is compelling. However, it has never been developed to a point of accessibility where it can be widely used and new applications could be freely explored. We designed kernel flow to overcome this. It is a modular system designed for full head coverage. It includes a combination of high performance custom detector circuits 
with high photon count rates, dual wavelength laser diodes, inertial measurement units, EEG channels, and it uses only a single USB-C cable to provide power and bidirectional data transfer. The system was designed with a hierarchical architecture so that we could meet the data transfer and timing requirements that enable full head coverage while also allowing for adaptation to different applications that may only require regional coverage. In this hierarchical configuration, we have one primary microcontroller that connects to the data acquisition PC and fans out to four secondary microcontrollers. The secondary microcontrollers each gather data from up to 13 time domain modules. All of the 52 modules in the system are synchronized to a common global clock reference to enable precise time alignment between all lasers and detectors in the system. In addition to these optical sensors, each microcontroller is paired with an inertial measurement unit and the primary microcontroller assembly includes an eight channel EEG front end and ADC for interfacing with dry active electrodes. Power and data are transmitted throughout the system over a wiring harness that connects all modules and microcontrollers together. Each of the modules in the system is identical and interchangeable. The modules include the required optics, lasers, and detectors for collecting time domain measurements. There are six custom designed detectors with integrated time to digital converters in each module. The detectors accumulate arrival times from incoming photons to generate histograms at a rate of one every five milliseconds. Two edge emitting lasers with wavelengths at 690 and 850 nanometers are combined through a prism and coupled into a 3.1 millimeter diameter source light pipe. Both lasers produce pulses with full width half max of less than 150 picoseconds. The pulse power is adjustable and is limited to below five milliwatts when driven at 100% duty cycle and the full 20 megahertz repetition rate. The optics included in the module are designed for efficient and comfortable coupling to the user's head. All optics are spring-loaded to conform to the curvature of the user's head and the detection optics are designed to maintain a constant intensity at the detector regardless of the amount of compression on the springs. We fit all of these electronics and optics into a module that weighs in at only 18 grams and measures about three centimeters in diameter and is approximately three centimeters tall. The rest of this talk will focus on the performance of this system. To gauge the performance of our system, we use well-established benchmarking protocols that have been used to evaluate TDNIR systems for several years. TDNIR systems have traditionally been bespoke, which made comparison between these difficult. The basic instrument performance, or BIP protocol, focuses on the raw system performance. The detector has traditionally been the focus of this protocol since most previous systems used large, well-controlled picosecond lasers. We consider both our laser and detector performance as part of BIP. The second protocol we use is the MedFOT protocol. This evaluates the ability of a TD-NIR system to accurately measure the optical properties of a diffusing medium, the ultimate goal we are after in doing TDF-NIRs. The first of the BIP measurements is the responsivity. This is a detector-centric measure of how efficiently our collection optics and detectors capture light as it exits a diffuse medium. Briefly, the measurement setup uses a collimated pulsed laser source with tunable power and a calibrated phantom. We use a power meter to measure the actual power incident on the calibrated phantom, and then use one of the custom detectors contained within a standard flow module to measure the detected signal in transmission mode. Here, we show the time domain measurements from our detector as a response to different average power levels incident on the phantom. These results show that as we increase the incident power by an order of magnitude, the raw photon count measured by our detector scales linearly from roughly 100 million counts per second to over a billion counts per second. Further, the constant responsivity demonstrates that we are able to achieve these high count rates and sensitivity without significant distortion from pileup. When we compare the performance of our modular system versus other reported TD near systems, as you can see from the K marks on this chart, we perform comparably to the previously reported systems. It is important to note that our detector is a silicon-based detector made using a commercially available CMOS process. 
As such, it has lower intrinsic responsivity than the PMT-based systems referenced in this chart. Additionally, we are not using any fibers for our collection system and use a short light pipe with two millimeter diameter and numerical aperture of around 0.67. Because the system is meant to precisely measure the temporal properties of the signal, it is important to characterize the time to digital converters that are used for digitizing the arrival time of detected photons. One key characteristic of the TDC is its differential nonlinearity. We have characterized our system according to the BIP methods. Here, we use a CW source to uniformly in time illuminate our sensors through an optical phantom for a duration of 100 seconds. The result of this measurement is a DNL value of 0.5 according to the specified metric. Additionally, we use a DNL correction scheme to compensate for the nonlinearities and are able to produce clean histograms as seen here. Continuing on the theme of the importance of time resolution in TD near systems, we next characterize the instrument response function, or IRF, of the system. This measurement uses the lasers within the module to directly illuminate the detectors. We have to attenuate the laser using an ND filter of about 0.4 in order to avoid saturating the detectors with the direct illumination. To do this, we constructed a custom fixture to measure the IRF in reflectance mode because the geometry of the module does not allow for direct source to detector coupling. We chose to use a matte surface for this reflection fixture to try to fill the, the full numerical aperture of the collection optics. We also measured the IRF in various configurations and found that there is no measurable difference in IRF shape for different reflectance or transmission geometries. This makes physical sense since our system uses short light pipes with a maximum optical path length of about 18 millimeters compared to a typical TD near systems that would use fibers with lengths ranging from one to three meters. The longer fibers introduce mode dependent delays which result in temporal dispersion of the signal. Here we report our full width half max values for both red and infrared lasers to take into account both the differences in laser diode performance and the wavelength dependent response of the detectors. Because we know that the later arriving photons are more likely to pass through brain tissue, we also characterize the full width 10% and 1% values for completeness. Since time domain systems rely on high gain photo detectors to measure the instant light, they are susceptible to a signal dependent noise source commonly called after pulsing. After pulsing is an effect where residual charge from a photon detection event enters the high gain region of the device with some delay and triggers a secondary event. We measure after pulsing as the difference between the noise floor after a high intensity pulse and the noise floor in the absence of a laser pulse. For a silicon based detector like ours, the after pulsing ratio is a function of the wavelength of light due to the differences in absorption lengths of silicon at these energies. Here, we demonstrate that our after pulsing ratio is incredibly low less than 1% for both cases, and that it is slightly higher for the longer wavelengths, as expected. The final measurement in the BIP protocol looks at the stability of the system as measured by changes in the IRF. Again, through looking at the IRF, we take into account the performance of both the lasers and the detectors during the measurement. Our system is passively cooled and uses an in-module control loop to stabilize the output power of our lasers. We show our measurements from a cold start and see that within 30 minutes we reach stability and achieve minimal variation in both detected counts and IRF temporal performance. Having completed the more fundamental device characterization, we now move on to evaluating how accurately our system can extract optical properties from known phantoms according to the MedFolk protocol. We selected this range of optical properties for our phantoms in order to match the expected biologically relevant range of values. For these measurements, we used an array of 12 phantoms with known optical properties that we acquired from Biopixis. Each phantom is five centimeters tall and 10 centimeters in diameter. For the optical properties of these phantoms, this size is sufficient to make a semi-infinite approximation reasonable. And we use a semi-infinite diffusion model when extracting optical properties from the measured histograms. Here, we show the results of using our measurements along with the semi-infinite model to estimate the optical properties of each phantom in the set. 
what we find is that we have good linearity for each step change in absorption or scattering for both wavelengths. Our accuracy for absorption is better than that for scattering, which is in agreement with similar findings by other TD near systems. Looking at the data a different way, we can see that there is good matching between the expected values from the calibration data that accompanied the phantom set and the measure values that we extract. As you can see from this table, the worst case errors occur at low scattering values. This is because the semi-infinite approximation is less appropriate for the physical size of our phantoms with low scattering coefficients. Each gray dot on this plot is the result of extracting the absorption and scattering properties from a single five millisecond histogram. This shows that we have both good accuracy and high precision in our measurements from just a single five millisecond histogram. In the plot, there are approximately 330 histograms for each phantom. This is every histogram from the data set. No outlier removal or other data cleanup was performed. We conclude our demonstration of our system performance with results showing classical hemodynamic responses from two different tasks. In the first task shown here, the participant alternated between paced breathing and a breath hold. The optical modules were placed in the purple locations as shown in the diagram in the top right. On the left, you can see the block average responses to this task on all of the channels using the convention of oxyhemoglobin in red and deoxyhemoglobin in blue. In the middle, we show the individual traces for each trial on the two channels that are circled in green. Each line shows a different trial. We see consistent results over trials and expected responses in both the prefrontal and motor regions as this is a task that should produce a systemic change over the whole head. On the right, you can see the oxy and deoxy traces over time for the full run. The blue shaded regions are the cued breathing and the green regions are when the breath hold portions of the task begin. The timing of the task is apparent in the traces as we see increases in deoxyhemoglobin shortly after the start of the breath hold along with periodic changes in oxyhemoglobin matched to the paced breathing. For the final task, we are showing brain responses to a classic cognitive neuroscience task called the Stroop task. For this task, the participant was cued with the text red, yellow, or blue written in red, yellow, or blue letters as shown in the example at the top of the slide. The objective is to correctly identify the color of the word. During congruent condition blocks, the words always match the color of the text. In mixed condition blocks, the words were sometimes in the matching color and sometimes in another color. The cognitive challenge becomes correctly identifying the color when the text is mismatched. For this task, we are showing prefrontal activations with the modules arranged in the purple locations as shown again in the diagram on the top right. To make the data a little easier to see, we've averaged responses over detectors on the same module. So really, there are many more individual channels than we're actually displaying here. For this task, we see the standard oxy and deoxy responses shown in red and blue, and the different task conditions as shown in solid versus dotted lines. The results show that we see differential activation to the congruent and mixed conditions, and stronger activation patterns towards the more lateral part of the forehead as expected, since this task tends to activate the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. The two channels circled in green are expanded on the right to make the detail a little more apparent. In summary, over the last three years, we have developed a completely overhauled TDF mirror system. Compared to previously reported systems, we have reduced the physical volume per channel by four orders of magnitude, achieved nearly 200 times higher sampling rate two orders of magnitude higher photon throughput, 10 times higher dynamic range, and significantly reduced the weight and power requirements of the system. We have achieved a level of integration that introduces the possibility of having wearable TDF near systems everywhere. In our push for deeper integration, we have also maintained the accuracy of optical property extraction and demonstrated functional brain activation. Thank you for your attention.